Uh, we're here, of course, for Bruce Kennett. Uh, the biography, W.A. Uh, Dwiggins, <laughs> A Life in Design, is an intimate and comprehensive look at Dwiggins' formidable life and work. Bruce has been writing about and lecturing about Dwiggins since 1980 and collecting his work since 1972. Bruce's work began on the book in 2003 at the encouragement of Rocky Steinhauer. After 15 years of research, photography, and writing, it's ready to be shared. Please join me in welcoming Bruce Kennett. Thanks for coming. First of all, I have to say I love this place. I have never felt more comfortable giving a talk anywhere than I do here tonight. So thank you for that. Um, obviously, I love Dwiggins. Many of you, show of hands, any, anybody who is uh, experiencing Dwiggins for the first time? Okay, a few people. I hope that for the rest of you, there will be a lot of revelations tonight because there are so many parts to him. And this is like a skimming of the surface. I, I have only an hour. I'm going to sort of speed through all of these images and show you all the parts of this brilliant man. And the book, which is just about 500 pages, again, only represents the tip of the iceberg for all the riches that are held in the Boston Public Library file. So I encourage you if you're ever in Boston, to go to the library. There are three rooms dedicated to his materials. All the marionettes that he made are on display. You can see his, all the furniture that he built, uh, the, the mural, which I'll show you tonight. So anyway, if, if you're in Boston, absolutely go to the BPL. So here's the world of Dwiggins, and I want to just take us on a, a whirlwind tour through all of these disciplines. We, we look at Ed Tufte's books and think about the visual display of this data. Well, Dwiggins was thinking about this in the teens and 20s. He was advocating paperbacks at a time when none of the trade publishers in the United States were thinking of paperbacks. He said, why not do that? Well, of course, by 1930, they started happening. He didn't come to type design until he was 48. And when you look at what he accomplished in the few years, that he, about 25 years that he was doing that, think of what we would have if he had had 50 or more years. And on around the circle we go. So I'm just gonna run through these. And if anybody has a question, if you see an image and you want to ask something, please shout out a question and we'll stop long enough to address that. Is the lighting crew around? Can we? OK. I want to show you two things from the early days. This is a newspaper that he made when he was seven years old. It has a display ad on the left for the boat shop. It has weather. It has a poem. There's even a space for wild art down in the lower right-hand corner. So at age seven, he's already forming letters this well and thinking about the, the various parts of a newspaper. For his eighth birthday, he was given a one by 12 plank of clear pine, eight feet long. And he used that for carving. He stole spools from his mother's sewing kit to make this mounted knight over on the right-hand side. The, the, uh, boats he made later in high school. But early on, he was working with pencil, forming words, drawing, and carving wood. And these are all themes to which he returned throughout his life. He went to art school in Chicago. I can't talk about any of that, but there was this, because of time constraints, but there was a three-year period when Frank Holm had this School of Illustration in Chicago, and Dwiggins' timing was impeccable to go there during those same three years. Then he moved to, Fred Gowdy encouraged him to come to Boston, so he moved to Boston. And he started doing uh, newspaper ads and food packaging labels and that sort of thing. So here's, imagine the helter-skelter uh, environment of the newspaper, and then in the middle of it is this oasis of calm. 
Here's a soup can label, all hand lettered. And so he, he wanted to make books and he was very interested in calligraphy. He, uh, he wasn't able to make books until later on. He had to kind of earn his keep working in advertising, dashing out headlines and making drawings of bureaus and, and wall hangings. But that was all time well spent. He learned a lot from it. Here are some of the dozens of book plates that he produced over the years, including this canting book plate on the right, the, the tradition of making a pun with the person's name. Right after Prohibition, this company hired him to make labels for all of their beers. He loved Boston. He moved there in 1904 and basically stayed until he died in 56. Filene's department store, which is our equivalent of Eaton's. And uh, for the 1920s, this is a pretty wild illustration. He did the first logotype for General Motors when all of these different car companies were pulled together. A friend of his who worked at BBD&O advertising in New York called him up uh, and there was a telephone order for this and he did it within two days and sent it off to Detroit. Here's a poster, very early use of Futura. It had just been cast and shipped to the United States. This is before he came out with his own sans serif typeface metro. So here are his trademark stencil shapes. Some comps for a magazine in the 1940s. And this gives an indication of the range of his thinking about how these, the, the one assignment was they don't have to be on the newsstand. These are by subscription. Therefore, you don't have to uh, attract the reader at the newsstand and have everything at the top. A year later, he did six more. Nothing ever came of these, as far as I know. In the 1920s, he had spent several decades working in advertising, and he wrote this amazing book called Layout and Advertising. Rod McDonald and I have been talking about this that there is so much valid information in that book, even though it comes out of the letterpress era. His ideas about clarity, simplicity, organization of material are, are very important, and it'd be fun to see this reprinted at some point. Harper's reissued it in 1948, uh, 20 years after the first edition, but then it did, didn't stay in print after that. So now we move into what we might call infographics. So here's something for S.D. Warren looking at what happens to the various people in the sales chain and how they influence sales as they radiate out from the manufacturing center. All hand lettered. Here is his argument that you need to use visual material to get your idea across instantly and always do it with human terms. So on the left is this illustration of the Bunker Hill Monument in Boston, and then I've enlarged the bottom of it that you can see on the right. And you instantly get that scale in a way that you can't if you're only looking at numerals. Here's another example showing household income and how it's divided. And then my particular favorite, there's the population and land mass of the two states of Montana and Ohio. This is the amount of Lustro, uh, Warren's Lustro paper produced in a year, standing next to the Woolworth building in New York City. This is in the McGill. Uh, McGill has a wonderful treasure trove of Dwiggins material in what's called the Colgate Collection. So if you get to Montreal, go to McGill Special Collections and ask for Dwiggins, and they will bring out heaps of things for you to see. Now we move on to books. He, he loved books. He was pursued by the Limited Editions Club and Random House to do very fancy books. He actually was a proletarian at heart and loved to deliver to the common reader 
the same experience in a $2.50 book that he was making for the highfalutin publishers who were charging $10 or $15 a book. This, this is one of the more highfalutin ones, but um, he, he absolutely loved delivering stories to readers in the form of books. Here's another one for Random with his trademark stencils. I was describing earlier to one of you that <clears throat> there's a place in this story where the time traveler stops and reaches into his pocket and pulls the flower out that his Eloy sweetheart had given to him. And Dwiggins changes the color of the ink when that one phrase is sat in type because Wells is going out of the storyteller's narrative and going back to, to his own shell on the outside. And, and it just shows Dwiggins' attention to those details. This is a book produced in Rochester, New York by the printing house of Leo Hart who thought he might want to try his hand at book publishing. So this is The Travels of Marco Polo. Not a signed limited edition, but uh, splendid nevertheless. These labels were designed to go on five book spines. So this is his trademark faded bright colors. And then here's what they look like on the books. So they look great on the shelf. This, this is my set that's now 85 years old, so the labels are quite faded. But as you saw in the originals, the, the way they were delivered in 1936, the colors really pop. This is a story that takes place in Mexico, and it has to do with Mayan mythology and music. And so there you have the dust jacket on the left and the title page on the right. He loved spines and felt that jackets were often discarded. Why not clothe the books with as much nobility as possible? When you look at these, there's Tchaikovsky, the composer, with a feather. And the red book in the middle, that guy is a seismographer who's studying what happens with tremors in the earth. And I just think all books should have this kind of livery these days, instead of having something set in Helvetica and hidden under the dust jacket. Shirer, the Berlin diary in the middle, William Shirer lived in Berlin in the 1930s. And again, you look at that, that uh, device underneath the author's name that seems to perfectly represent what he was feeling when he was there. I, at this point, can go into a, an antiquarian bookseller and just kind of run my eye along the shelf and kind of almost immediately pick out which ones were, were done by Dwiggins. This is... Uh, one of my most favorite of his cover designs, that's silver foil on blue and white canvas cloth and then black foil stamping for the title. Here are some book covers. These are all foil stamped. This one is blind stamped on the left and then the others have colored ink, which was the less expensive way for Knopf to produce them. Did a lot of books for Robert Nathan, who was a, a best-selling author for Knopf, made a lot of money for them in the 30s and 40s. When he first got to, we're now transitioning into calligraphy, when he first got to Boston, he did a lot of these sentimental broadsides for a publisher named Bartlett, who was also his landlord. So these, um, these things were, were maybe Oh, I can't think in centimeters. But anyway, about 8 by 10 inches, something like that. Here's a close-up of that B. So he did a lot of this in his 20s when he first arrived in the city. Gaudi left. Gaudi said, come join us in, in uh, Hingham. It's a beautiful town. You'll love it here. And then Fred and, and Bertha said, oh, we can't make a living here. We're, we're leaving. <laughs> and they went to New York and left Bill and Mabel in the lurch. But Bill and Mabel loved Hingham so much, they just stayed there. So he and Gaudi 
had talked in as early as 1907 about getting a society of calligraphers together, and Dwiggins ended up creating this whole society. It was fictional. He, he was he was the secretary, and the president was this guy Hermann Puterschein. And I'll tell you more about him in a minute. And uh, so they set up this whole publishing program, and he sent certificates around to people whose work he admired in publishing and fine art. And you see here in, in the bookmarks that are outside, which uh, you can have at the end of the talk, this is Koba Deishi, who was a real person, a medieval monk in Japan, who was an engineer and also a really great calligrapher. His followers are holding up a scroll on the other side of the stream, and as he holds the brush up, characters are appearing on the, the scroll over there. So that was the, the symbol of the Society of Calligraphers. So here's a, a stock certificate that he made for uh, a bank owned by the father of a friend of his. Absolutely gorgeous and so different from the kind of um, typical stock certificate with all the doodahs all over them. Some lettering done in the teens for a paper company. Lettering for S.D. Warren. You sure can see that he's going to turn into a type designer pretty soon, but he, at this point he wasn't doing that yet. This is the cover of a book in 1930 that Paul Hollister wrote called American Alphabets, where he uh, showcased the work of about a dozen lettering artists. This is available as a digital font. I think it's called Dwiggins Deco, so one can get that from the, the various font sellers. He played around a lot with stencils, and as he uh, worked on, on his stencil designs, he thought, oh, I can use these for making typefaces. So these are actually built up from stencils that he cut in celluloid. Later on, he made an alphabet called Imperial that uses these elements. This is his first type. Uh, he wrote in that book, lay out an advertising, there isn't a good sans serif type the, the European types are, are okay in the capitals, but they're bum in the lower case. And Linotype said, oh yeah, can you do better? And he said, yes. So he designed Metro, and this is what the Metro Black looks like. That's the first weight that they produced. Here's Metro Medium. This is the, probably the first book set in Metro. This is Rockwell Kent's book, and I love the dark color of this metro medium type and it fits perfectly with the, the uh, density of Kent's illustrations. At the same time, he was thinking about a modeled sans serif. Hermann Zopf, who designed Optima, was shocked to see this. He went to the Cary Collection at Rochester at one point and was amazed to see that Dwiggins had been thinking about this decades before he did for, for the type that eventually was called Optima. This was not produced, though. Griffith at Linotype said no commercial potential. So here is Electra, and my book was set in a new version of Electra done by uh, Jim Parkinson out in California. And this and Caledonia were certainly his two great uh, successes in printing types. He did over a dozen designs, but um, five or six of them were released commercially, and Electra and Caledonia were the the most successful. So here's Electra up big. He wanted it to be reflective of modern times and, and uh, there, there is a kind of energy in the letter that really fits that. Here's Caledonia, which happens to be my favorite. It's In a way, it's the most self-effacing of his types, but it's workmanlike. It just gets the job done. And here's Caledonia up big. This is Caravan that grew out of his experiments with stencils. So they made these in 30 pica um, bits of metal that could be put into the chuck of the machine so that you could cast a whole line of 6-point or 12-point or 18-point ornaments, and then you just put it in the saw and cut the um, measure that you wanted. So these slides were uh, available and used either as borders or, as you can see here, done in combination in several colors. 
he liked using shapes that were like the shapes of making the type letters themselves. This is El Dorado, which was released in the 1950s and was designed to have a very narrow set personality. So it has a rich, dark color. And in fact, Michael has brought a copy of a book. Michael, Michael, can you raise your hand? Is it okay if I'm talking about this? Okay. There's an absolutely beautiful book that he brought to, to uh, the meeting tonight that sat in El Dorado and impeccably printed. Shows the type off beautifully. Okay, this is Falcon, which was also released uh, eventually, but not before Dwiggins died. Here's some composition by Andrew Steves in Falcon, Andrew the printer and publisher in uh, Kentville, Nova Scotia, Gasparo Press. And he worked on the letterpress portfolio for the Dwiggins book. This is Arcadia a face that Dwiggins hoped would sell to the advertising crowd, and he referred to it as a trimming of Diana's toenail. <laughs> and it is wonderfully delicate. This has never been digitized. Uh, this is Stuyvesant. Based on types made by Rosart sort of a Dutch style. He was fascinated by Bodoni, but said that all Bodoni's work itself was wonderful, but the commercial renderings of it in the 20th century had all the grace of a galloping cow. And he wanted to make something that he called Tippecanoe that had more energy. And if you look, the type on the top, it's a little hard, I realize, in the slide presentation for you to see it, but the, there's more energy going on in the letters at the top, and the, the Bodoni at the bottom is a little more stolid. And this is Winchester, which Walter Tracy said was one of the great text types of the 20th century, in the bottom row, in the, the typical Roman. Dwiggins loved what he called Winchester English, which is the top here, and I think it's really strange. And he said, oh, you'd get accustomed to it, and there are fewer ascenders and descenders, and therefore isn't that good. But I like the Winchester at the bottom better. He also did a lot of work for typewriter companies. So this is a, a design for the Underwood Company based on the italics used by Aldo Manuzio, Aldus Manutius. Not produced in the end. Decorated initials for an edition of Balzac, produced by the Limited Editions Club. He did a lot of books at the Plimpton Press for Knopf. Plimpton Press was just a couple of towns away from him, so he designed all of these initials in four sizes that could be put into the Knopf books as photo engravings mounted on wood. And these are all used in the chapter openings of my book. He experimented with pattern a lot. He took um, cherry and maple bits of wood and carved shapes in them on the plank, not end grain, and then stamped them in multiple ways to create something like this piece that he did for C.H. Pepper, the Boston um, landscape painter. So that's all made from little wooden stamps, tediously repeated one after another. The I think the height of the wooden stamps is this book cover, uh, title page. So there's some pen and ink here, but most of what you see printed in green was done originally in India ink on illustration board using wooden stamps. Very quickly, he discovered that he was interested in a kind of uh, abstract energy. So these are um, ornaments, headpiece ornaments that he did for Harper's Magazine. And pretty soon, he was making them like this. And he was using celluloid. He made his own, um, there were no X-Acto knives in those days, so he cut his own um, blades, uh, sharpened them from hacksaw blades, and cut celluloid to build these things up. 
And by the late 1920s, this is the kind of composition that he's making with these stencils. Three different notices for the Boston painter. Javi uh, uh, Pepper would just say, do whatever you want, use any materials you want, I'm happy with whatever you do. So he had carte blanche for the whole decade of the 20s doing notices for, for Pepper, and these are all reproduced at actual size in the book. Here's a piece for S.D. Warren. He's playing back and forth between reality and the abstract. Plant forms, well, no, they aren't really. Wallpaper designs. In illustration, he often expressed his disdain at the people who thought that it was okay to beat on each other. So this is from 1914. This is a print that was put into the Cornhill booklet. And he came from a Quaker background. He did a, a lot of work in both world wars trying to discourage people from being involved. He wasn't an isolationist. He just thought we should work together rather than killing each other. Here he's channeling William Morris. This is a, a um, paper broker in New York City. This is an illustration for a, an eighth grade science textbook. And when you look at that ship, that's just unprinted paper. But it looks so brilliantly lit, doesn't it? Just from the way that the, the other black marks have been arranged on the page. This is a portrait of Chicago done for a Carl Sandburg book that Crosby Gage published in the late 1920s. Illustration for Strathmore. For a novel called Java Head that Knopf published in the 1940s. And again, 3D or 2D, there's all this wiggle room going on that he loves to, to play in. Here he's using his stencil vocabulary, but these illustrations were probably made mostly with pen and ink, not with stencils, but they're very much in that style. This is another Robert Nathan book called One More Spring. His friend Elizabeth Coatsworth wrote a bunch of ghoulish poems, and here you have these sort of vaguely plant forms on the top and then more realistic stuff at the bottom. So these are all bits that uh, illustrated or decorated the poems in the book. And this is the one book that was set in Tippecanoe, that Bodoni-esque type that he designed. He loved making maps. This was done when he was still in his 20s with all the, the places where story, story books happen in the Middle East. Sherwood Forest, and so forth. Map for a book that Carl Rollins did for the Grolier Club. One of his new studio in Boston. This is a, a version of the Bible for young readers that Knopf published in the 1940s and there are a number of maps in it that Dwiggins made. No one talks about him as a cartographer, but I think that's a great strength of his. Here, there was a, a book that the typophiles put out celebrating the ampersand, and in, in Dwiggins' contribution, he's kind of celebrating and making fun of Gaudi. And so, at the bottom, it says, a map of East, etc., showing the relative positions of the ampersand pit where the seraph was overtaken and strangled in the inn. And the dashed line is the Dr. Gowdy's path, and the dotted line is the flight of the doomed seraph. <laughs> he loved making woodcuts. Here's his childhood friend, Ralph Morris. This is called the tobacco machine. Petruchka, the block cut in 
oh, I think 1921, but not printed until the 1950s. This is from one of his many fantasy stories, and this is a, a, a bunch of delegates going to visit the city of Ageb. Here are uh, prints from a suite that he did of Sinbad's voyages and adventures, and the one on the right is called Marooned, and I think it has amazing poignance. This is a painting called The Incandescent Cheese. <laughs> and here you can see, this. he did this in the teens, on that wall hanging, you can see the repetitive elements that drove him to make the wooden stamps that I showed you earlier. Another watercolor. This is a carpet that he designed and his wife Mabel hooked for their niece, Eleanor Hoyle. And if you look, you can see E-H over on the left-hand side. <coughs> This is in the Boston Public Library. As is this, this is the dining room mural. He made three different murals for the house. <clears throat> so this is Sinbad's home port. He loved carving and sculpture. This is something that he gave to Dorothy Abbey in 1953, but I'm sure he made it earlier, because by then he had pretty serious palsy. <clears throat> this is the first marionette, Lilith, who was about to go get hitched to Adam, but he ended up using a different Lilith for the play. I, I love this puppet. These are all faces that he carved for a uh, thing sort of like Treasure Island where pirates kidnap a, uh, a young boy. This is a control for one of his marionettes. All the things that he created felt great in the hand and had beautiful shape to respond to touch. This is a goddess that would, that would be lit gradually that was on stage in one of his marionette plays all carved out of pine. He also loved to write. So here's this story about Hermann Putreschein. Uh, there was a family party and uh, the, his cousin who loved making puns, they were trying to figure out this family of Germans who had come to the United States and they couldn't come up with the right name. And Duygen said, you know, no matter what I do, I can't make the damn pewter shine. It just won't take a shine. I can't make the damn pewter shine. And, and Larry said, te dam pewter shine, that's it. So this guy came from Darmstadt, te dam pewter shine, and he had two sons, Hermann and Jakob, which coincidentally had the same birthdays as Dwiggins and his cousin Larry. And for decades, they issued all these printed pieces um, with pewter shine uh, often being the author. And here's Carl Rollins, the university printer at Yale, dressed up as Putreschein. And in 1929, when the AIGA gave Dwiggins a gold medal in New York, he was just about to accept it, and this guy stands up in the back of the room and says, wait a minute, I want equal credit here. And it was, and it was Rollins dressed up as, as HP. He, uh, his mother was a very accomplished musician and he grew up in a household that loved music and literature. And here he's talking about printer's ornament and comparing it to the ways that music is composed. It's a beautiful essay, this is in the book. He also talked about the book as a theatrical event. What happens when the curtain goes up on the title page? How do you handle these various things? He was doing this in 1926 when he really hadn't even started working for Knopf or the other book publishers, but he already was locked onto the idea of how to do it well. He loved satire. So in 1919, he published this book attacking the Boston publishers for their being such slackers in quality of manufacture and design. And this ended up having, he printed this himself, he and, and Larry, his cousin, and it ended up having a real effect on uh, book 
design and manufacture over the next 20 years. And Print Magazine actually wrote an article about it in the 1940s. Here he's attacking the design of American money. So that caption says, infuriated artists demolishing the Bureau of Engraving and Printing at Washington, morning of the 6th of July, 1951, first phase of the communist revolution. This is, book was done in 1932. So he criticizes American money and says, why does it look the way it does when it could look so beautiful? And then he shows what it could look like. So there's a five crown note front and back from this fictitious place called the Antipodes. This book was reprinted. Uh, uh, David Godin, the Boston publisher, has copies of the reprint of this book for which I did an introduction. Dwiggins uh, commuted on the train and wrote all of these stories in the half hour that he was traveling between Hingham and Boston when he had a studio downtown. And he wrote all these stories about a place that could be now, could be a thousand years ago. Where is it? Maybe Uzbekistan, Persia, who knows exactly. And they all have human interest topics. Here are fishermen on two sides of a river who get into a fight over the fishing rights and then eventually resolve it. Again, using his faded bright colors. Here's a, a, a civilization of people who live on floating islands. So in the foreground, you see a catamaran sailing toward this, what looks like an aircraft carrier is actually an island with, with uh, trees on it. And then here's another story from that same series. I hope in the next couple of years to reissue all of these together as a group, because Dwiggins never saw them published together. They were only issued individually, and, and then only three or four out of all the ones that he wrote. He also wrote plays. He had a private marionette theater. He did everything with the productions, and he wrote the plays, and in some cases, printed them. Here's another one. This is, again, Lilith getting ready to go get hitched to Adam. They converted the garage behind the house in Hingham to a marionette theater. He discovered in 1930 that this was the confluence of his interest in theater and in carving wood. There's what the proscenium looks like, and this is at the Boston Library where you can see it. Then he designed a new studio in 1937 and built the bottom floor was a theater that could uh, hold up to 70 people. And this one has this for the proscenium. And that thing at the top is Ho Tai, the Chinese god of good times and small children. And it was made by Dwiggins plunging a knife into the paper and then bending it. And as the house lights went down, you saw this figure. He made these tickets, which were hand colored with pochoir and passed out to everybody who came to the plays. This is in, in the 1930s they were doing this. He wrote a book about marionette engineering and his puppetry, his, his engineering of marionettes is still studied. I gave a talk at the Ballard Institute in Connecticut last year and he's still on the curriculum for um, puppet design. They have no idea he did anything with calligraphy or type. They think all he did was marionettes. So uh, the audience would yell, author, author, and he'd get up, walk backstage, and the, he never operated the marionettes himself. He liked to stay in the audience. And then this 12-inch high version of himself would come out on stage and take a bow. <laughs> this is one-eyed Dick, black scourge of the Caribbean, the pirate captain. Here's a master of ceremonies for another one of the plays. This is a dancer made out of aluminum foil covered cardstock. Aluminia, and when we came up with the new typeface uh, to use in the book, we decided to call that type Aluminia. So she was a very good dancer, and you can see how she, she can reflect different colors of light that are coming from the wings. And there she is, rendered in Dwiggins' flat illustration style. That's the dust jacket of the, the book about marionette engineering. Here's another dancer, this one made from cast plaster. This is Marina, and she was, according to Dwiggins' assistant Dorothy, the best dancer of the, the whole troupe. 
And here we have a private moment between Marina and Dwiggins in the green room. Here is an ice demon on the left made out of cellophane and a metal demon on the right made out of cardstock with aluminum foil. This is from a play where machines have taken over the earth and there's a band, ragged band of human insurgents that are fighting them. This is a machine called Handling Machine that picks up humans in its jaws and puts them into that little marsupial pouch in the base. Here's a bird that flies across the stage. He also made a monkey that climbed a rope and disappeared. Here are some of the marionettes that he produced. In all, something like 60. Costume design. He would do the watercolor sketches and then supervise the making of the costumes, although Mabel and friends of hers were the ones who did most of the stitching. Here's a set. This is a wharf in uh, southwest England in the 18th century, and that set is about 10 inches deep and maybe three and a half feet wide. Here's a watercolor sketch for a, a play that was never produced that featured Marina, the dancer. This is Prelude to Eden. So there you have Lilith on the left and then the other three members of the cast with that painted background. Here's a, uh, a medieval play where this gluttonous monk wants to eat these two women out of house and home. And so you see on the left Wigan's first idea for the set. And then here's the set as built. Now here's looking down on it with the puppeteers above. And then here's Dwiggins, the director, giving notes to the cast. He did all the lighting design and built with a, an electrical engineering friend all of the equipment for the two theaters that he did. Very, very detailed instructions. So he was painting with light as he was designing these plays. There's the electrical panel that he built. This is a bulletin board for the house with a close up on the right of that top 3D sculpture. Uh, he built a uh, dining table, chairs. Here's a sideboard for the dining room with these carved knobs with a peacock and a flower blossom. There's a lamp. These are all in Boston also. This is a life-size codfish for the top of the house, made out of copper. He loved flying and making kites, especially melee kites that didn't have any tails. And that's his cousin, Larry. Here they are. There's a kite already up in the air. And what's now flying up the string, that triangular bit, is actually represented over on the right-hand side. That's a sail. And there are two rollers and this whole trolley, which holds a dozen, oh, uh, whirling spirals or parachutes or Chinese fish kites, whatever he might want to release. That would go zooming up the kite string, propelled by that uh, sail hung from the yard arm. And then when the cork at the upper right hit the kite that was up in the air, it would release all of these other bits that would come down and the neighborhood children would go flying after them, collecting them. He loved making tools, often would make a tool for a single purpose, and wrapping them in the Japanese style. That's a sharpening stone at the back with a box that he carved himself out of cherry to, to store it in. Beautiful little strap hammer in the foreground. He carved almost everything in the studio that he made in 1937. These are door latches, just going from one part of the house to another. Everything in his environment he wanted to affect in some positive way. The place where he built the studio 
had been a livery stable, and the lower level, it was built on the edge of a kettle hole, and the lower level was a pigsty. So when he built this new building in 1937, he carved these runes which say, here dwigs following pigs. And that was put up in the studio. And here you can see him at work at his table, and on the radiator in the back is a magnifier that he made, which not only goes up and down with that uh, diagonal strut that you can see, but it also goes in and out so that he could use it effectively as he was working on type designs and illustrations. And the, I want to close by reading something that may be familiar to some of you, but to me, he, he wrote this when he was 41, and this sums up his feelings about life. And here you see his, uh, he's 10 years away from designing a uh, serif type for text, but you can feel in the bones of this calligraphy where he wanted to be designing type. So, myself, I hope to live in a land that I have made out of potsherds and broken bits. It's not a well-articulated country, and it's not different from a many that other people have made. There are old things in it, but it is not old. I managed to have arched masonry dug out of Rome and Greek fragments of marble but the colonists from Greece have forgotten their fatherland and pasture their cattle under the columns. There are glints from the east in the land, if there are really no Easterners there. I use words to furnish this part of the country, Samarkand and Isfahan. They do as much as real colonists would, and much more musically. I do not need real things in this part. I choose, rather, invocations of memories or imaginings. All the claptrap of oriental imagery serves me very well. Dust and sun and faded bright colors. There are no cities, and there are only the more picturesque sorts of merchants. How the inhabitants live, I'm not too much inclined to ask, being over close to the problem myself in this part of the world. But they're mostly countrymen and work in the soil. You will see that the country is hopelessly romantic. Hopelessly to you, I mean. For a time back, I was ashamed of its nearness to ruined Rome and hid its existence. Now I've grown careless about your opinions and I'm inclined to live in whatever land I please. Thank you. Yes. Where did he most enjoy being? I think he said that type design is what he wanted to be remembered for. If there was a single thing that had to be isolated, he would be proudest of his type designs. But I think what he was really interested in was mining what he learned from one thing that he was working on and applying it to something else. He, he figured out that marionette faces that were natural in their contours, didn't read very well from the audience. Faces that were faceted, read with much more emotional power. And he then took that idea and incorporated it into the design of a newspaper type that he was working on for Linotype, where the counters were angular rather than round. And so I think he loved having all these plates in the air at once and, and working on everything simultaneously. Yes. Did he ever do any teaching? Did he have students or apprentices? Did he do any teaching? Did he have students or apprentices? Only through his friends. He he never taught. He had no children. He he had Dorothy, who we have to be very grateful to her. She arrived in 1947 and immediately saw the situation. Mabel was getting dementia and had bad asthma. Dorothy was independently wealthy and just moved into the Dwiggins household, did all the cooking, and she added probably 10 years to Dwiggins' life through her organization, and then she kept like a dragon sitting on treasure. She kept all of this stuff together and made sure that it went into the Boston Public Library where it could be properly housed. So it's tragic in a way that he didn't have any students. You look at somebody like Ernst Schneidler and the, the sort of DNA that flows out of him, 
that's not true for Dwiggins. He just affected positively all the people that were around him. The, the mural that's in the Boston Public Library was somehow taken out of the house in Hingham. How they got it out, I don't know, because he painted it on a plaster wall. But somebody with great skill removed it, and it is now set up in one of these three rooms that are devoted to Dwiggins' um, studio and marionette productions. So you can go into the special collections and see it on, on the wall right there. Yes. Did, did he travel abroad? Uh, D.B. Updike, the great Boston printer, saw in him tremendous potential and lobbied with Mabel's father, who was a wealthy lumber dealer, to split the cost of Updike and Mabel's father sending them to Europe for four months. So when they were in their 20s, late 20s, they went to England, France, and Italy and studied all the museums and traveled around. After that, once he got diabetes, he had very, I didn't even mention this before, but in, in 1922, the year that the Canadians discovered insulin, Dwiggins was diagnosed with very brittle diabetes and he would have died within a year if there were no insulin. But instead we had him until 1956, so more than 30 years. Once he got back from that trip to Europe, he basically never, he went to Ohio to his hometown a couple of times, but otherwise he just stayed put. He loved staying put. When, he, when the AIGA had a big show for him in 1937, Mabel went to represent them and Bill just stayed home. He didn't, he didn't want anybody to make a fuss over him. He, he'd rather just stay home and cut stencils. Yes? So how did he pick up his marionette tradition and did he travel where there's this tradition of small theaters? In fact, Gustav Bauman, the great printmaker from New Mexico, was a friend of his from his Chicago days around 1900 and they were in touch with each other. The one time Dwiggins did take a trip in 1936, he went for almost a week to Detroit where Paul McFarlane had convened this conference, puppetry conference, and so he was willing to travel for the, to that in 1936. But otherwise, he did it all by correspondence, and I think he was always interested in theater. He, it never occurred to him that he could make his own marionettes, and then one day in 1930, his friend Bill Crosby, they had this group of writers that would get together to write plays and short stories. Bill brought in these two clothespin very crude marionettes, and Dwiggins looked at it and said, I want to do that. And it was this coup de foudre where he suddenly realized, I can carve these things, I'm good at it, and I can write plays for them. So he built his two marionette theaters right there, but didn't really um, take the shows on the road or anything. The marionettes never performed anywhere else. Yes? Can, were his shows ever filmed? The shows were never filmed. I do have, I've interviewed a couple of people who are in their 90s. One of them remembers going to the shows but couldn't give me a lot of detail. The other one, and it's, this is printed in the book, she remembered trick-or-treating at the Dwiggins' house and they would knock on the door and this marionette would come out. <laughs> holding a little basket with two pieces of candy in it and offer it. And they would take the candy out and then the door would close. The marionette would recharge, the door would open, and then the marionette would come out and offer the basket again. But as far as we know, nothing was um, filmed. And in fact, Mabel, in her deeper dementia, she lived for 10 years longer than Dwiggins, and Dorothy took care of her after Dwiggins died for, for another 10 years, which I think was really wonderful of her. One day, Dorothy caught Mabel cutting all the strings of the marionettes in some kind of confusion. And so she got help with the restringing of them. So the marionettes are okay, they weren't damaged, but the strings were all cut. 
I wish that somebody could, the, the sets are all there, the proscenia are there, they could sort of stage these. Some of them had songs that Elizabeth Coatsworth had written, they had live music, they had clarinet, uh, reed organ, piano, all this in the second theater, the reason that he made it so big in his custom designed building that he made in 37 was so that they could have live music. So it must have been wonderful. Yes? How did I get interested in Dwiggins? In 1972, when I was 22, I went into the Boston Public Library and with my roommate Jeff, and we met Dorothy, and um, I immediately started going to visit her. I, I didn't really know, I had just graduated from college with a degree in humanities. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was really moved by Dwiggins' work and started going to visit Dorothy, and got more and more interested in Dwiggins' things. And I, I went home to New Hampshire to visit my parents and told them about this guy whose work I'd discovered. And they said, yeah, you lived around the corner from him when you were a baby. <laughs> so I was born in the hospital in Boston. And after whatever, two days or three days, my mother and I went back to this place where my parents were crashing. My, my dad was finishing up an architecture degree at MIT and they were between apartments, so they were staying with friends in Hingham, Massachusetts. So the first place I lived when I got out of the hospital after I was born was a few streets away from Duigan's. So that was pretty cool. Yes? The question is how much of his correspondence survives and how interesting is it? It's fascinating, especially the, the conversations with Rudolf Rizika and Carl Rollins. The three of them formed this triumvirate of support in carrying the banner for good design and integrity. Rollins went into um, a, a sort of lefty community in central Massachusetts, which is where some of you may know the centaur type designed by Bruce Rogers. Rollins printed that book in Montague, Massachusetts in this intentional community and uh, used Centaur for the first time. He then got lured away to Yale and he had all of these issues with suddenly having to be in the city and working in this big machine of Yale University and so on. Well, the, the kinds of comments made back and forth among these three friends to each other are fascinating and at first I only saw Rollins's letters to Dwiggins and then I went to the Rollins collection at Yale and it's it's like hearing the others, first you're hearing a phone conversation in a room, you're only hearing what the person in the room with you is saying. So to go to New Haven and see what Dwiggins had been writing to Rollins was fascinating. He was a wonderful correspondent. His writing is so vivid and, and full of life and, and insights. So his correspondence is terrific.